So, we've been getting more and more information as of late about James Gunn's new Superman movie. Now no longer titled Superman Legacy, and instead just Superman. And I'm getting really excited. I think James Gunn is an incredibly talented filmmaker who brings so much love and passion to all of his projects. Superman is one of my favorite fictional characters of all time, and from the way he's been talking about this movie, I think he's gonna be bringing that same level of passion to the start of this new DC universe. So, these are 10 things that I want from Superman Legacy. Wait, shit, I mean Superman. Just Superman. Yeah, that's gonna take a little while to get used to. But before we get started, this is weird. I'm getting a message from the team behind Marvel Strike Force, the sponsor of today's video. You know, normally they would do this by email, but I guess a multiversal message works too. This year is the sixth anniversary of Marvel Strike Force, and they want me to put together my dream team of Marvel characters for a limited time events and challenges. If you don't know, Marvel Strike Force is a turn-based action RPG that allows you to battle with your favorite team of heroes and villains to save the universe from threats like Doctor Doom and Apocalypse. Mix and match characters from all corners of the multiverse for an experience unlike any other single player game. They're serious an insane number of characters in this game from all over the Marvel Universe, including even picks from the comics that even I'm not familiar with. They even have original characters to Marvel Strike Force, and they're super cool, like Spider Weaver, a Navajo weaver chosen to safeguard the web of life and destiny. But I love being able to mix and match teams that never in a million years would work together, or just build out the perfect dream team for the challenges ahead. I'm thinking Spider-Man, 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 and Cosmo the Dog. Hey Marvel, when are you getting out on that team book? Complete weekly events to earn prizes and special anniversary items. During the anniversary event, there are exclusive rewards for logging in daily, including character shards, anniversary orbs, gear, and more. Participate in milestone events where completing milestones grants you gold, training items, and a Nick Fury costume. And experience throwbacks to epic moments in the Marvel Strike Force history by celebrating key villains like Doctor Doom, Mephisto, and Apocalypse. Mephisto confirmed for Marvel Strike Force. This anniversary is only going to be around for a limited time, so download Marvel Strike Force for free today and use promo code MSF6 for 310 Deadpool shards, 500 power cores, and 5 premium orbs if you're a new user. But don't worry, because if you already play the game, you can use the promo code NIGHT, N-I-G-H-T, to receive 15 Nightcrawler shards, 500 power cores, and 5 premium orbs. Thanks so much to Marvel Strike Force for sponsoring this video, and thanks to my patrons who get all my videos early and ad-free for just $1 a month. And yes, I'm aware the irony of doing a Marvel-adjacent sponsor for a Superman video is not lost on me. The first, and probably the most important thing that I want to see is a Clark Kent with personality. I think a lot of people have this notion that Superman and Clark Kent is just a blank slate of a character. Just a boy scout without any real personality or identity, and that's why the character is so boring. A lot of writers feel like Superman has to be a wet mop. They focus too much on the alien and the super, and never enough on the man and making him a relatable character. Man of Steel specifically focused so much on these big ideas of how would people react if Superman was real, and what if Superman was Jesus, that his actual personality fell by the wayside. There were glimmers there, don't get me wrong, but it always felt like subtext. I think Cavill could have done a great job in the role if he'd been given a little bit better material, but all he had to work with was looking stern and then the occasional grimace. Wait, wait, not that grimace. It was a similar situation with Brandon Ruth, who wasn't given the best opportunity with Superman Returns, but thankfully was able to redeem himself a little bit with the CW Crisis event. But I want to see a Clark Kent that's genuinely earnest and kind. The dorky guy who, even though he's an alien from outer space, spent his whole life raised on a farm in Kansas and everything that comes with that. It's part of why I think my adventures with Superman is so great, because that show's characterization of Clark was so immediately likable and relatable. We see his anxiety and his struggles, but also that he's just a regular dude who wants to do the right thing. His desire to help people isn't driven by trauma or some innate universal purpose, but just because he wants to. These bigger cosmic issues come second to just making Superman a likable character. And I hope that James Gunn realizes this and is able to bring that to life. I have a lot of hope because the dude has shown he can take basically anything and turn them into a lovable character. I'm not even talking about Rocket or Groot because of course I'm going to love the talking raccoon and the silly little tree guy, but I'm talking about fucking Peacemaker. James Gunn somehow made this guy a genuinely interesting and compelling and likable character. How the hell did that happen? I think depending on how far into Superman's career this movie's taking place, it could be really interesting to do what Superman Smashes the Klan did. I know I talk about that book, like, all the time, but it's a really good fucking comic, okay? In that, writer Gene Lu and Yang really focused on the allegorical implications of Superman's Kryptonian heritage and how he reacts to it. When he first finds out he's an alien, he's scared. He feels like a freak. He looks at himself in the mirror and sees a green-skinned monster. All while the book simultaneously tells the story of an immigrant family facing similar real-world problems. It's a great story, and Yang pulled from a lot of personal experience to tell it, and I'd love to see something similar to that arc and that struggle on the big screen. Also, I swear to God, let David keep his curly hair. For years, we had Henry Cavill, this dude whose hair just naturally falls into the exact perfect shape for Superman, and he keeps it that way in literally every single interview we ever see of him, and yet for every movie he was in, they slathered it with product and just slicked it straight back. It's like, what is this, Blaine from Glee? 
which is, uh, Derek Chris was also Superman, so I guess it tracks. I don't need like a full on spit curl like the comics or anything. I get that might be difficult to pull off, but just like some curls or some waves or some texture or something going on there. Jesus Christ. I also really want to see the secret identity be a big deal again. I feel like so much superhero media has just thrown out secret identities to the point where in Marvel, it's really just Spider-Man and Daredevil who still have one. And one of those had to be fixed magically on a multiversal level. But that dual identity of Clark Kent and Superman is really important to the core of the character and the different masks he puts on in his daily life. There's the man he really is, the man he wants to be for the world, and the man that he uses to disguise himself, glasses and all. The next thing I want to see is a good costume. Honestly, I think pretty much all the Superman suits we've gotten in the movies have been pretty solid for the most part. Christopher Reeve especially, these pictures of him looked like Superman actually existed in the 70s. I love it. But since then, they've all come close to that, but never quite reached that same level. Now, at the time of recording this, we haven't gotten a full look at the entire suit yet, but Gunn has revealed at the very least what the logo is going to look like. It's very clearly inspired by Alex Ross's Kingdom Come design, although with yellow instead of black. I'm not normally a huge fan of that logo. I think it works great for what Kingdom Come is doing, but I don't like how oversimplified and sharp it usually is. But I gotta say, I really love it here. There are a few little tweaks and changes. It feels more round and softer despite being so minimal. And I really love the addition of the yellow trim around the outside. It feels like a mix of all the different emblems from the past with the Kingdom Come design, the classic colors, and then with the outline of the Fleischer logo. And I especially love just how big it is. That was my biggest problem with the Superman Lois design. I love a big logo on the chest. Though I do wish that the bottom had a little bit more thickness or just like a little extra nub to make the S shape stand out a bit more. And it is kind of weird to give him basically the exact same logo that Brandon Ruth had at the end of the crisis event, but that was only for like three seconds. So I don't know if he can claim ownership of that. But at that point, I'm sounding like a Spider-Man fan with all the suit nitpicking. It could also be interesting if there's like a story element to it. Like maybe this crest is the exact crest of the House of L, like the one from Krypton and the one that Jor-El wears. But then later down the line, Clark modifies it to look more like an S to combine both his Kryptonian and his Earth identities. I tend to prefer my Superman suits to be clearly cloth looking, but I like the texture from what we can see. It's not as in your face or alien as what they were doing with Cavill's, and it looks like they're not pulling an MCU or a Fortnite and just throwing lines all over the place, which is always a plus. I also really hope that they don't do the collar thing from the new 52 or the Fortnite design. The high collar just kind of it feels like too military for me for some reason. It might be unrealistic, but I'm really hoping to go the route of having his suit made for him by Martha. That feels like it'd be such an easy way to distinguish itself from other interpretations and instantly ground the character instead of making him wear a fancy Kryptonian armor. Superhero costumes can just be costumes. They don't have to justify themselves within universe. And it might be an interesting meta commentary depending on Superman's relationship with the other heroes in this movie. Don't ask me how Martha could get that kind of texture on a suit. Maybe she's just like really good at screen printing or something. I'd really like for the cape to be shorter, like more knee level instead of going down to the floor like he's Batman. And I also like when it has the yellow logo on the back. There's something so whimsical about how the cape looks in the Reeve movies. It feels like the classic circus strongman that originally inspired the Superman design. And on that note, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I really wanted to have the trunks. I know that this is such a hotly debated topic or whatever, and honestly, I've really appreciated the resurgence we've seen of the trunks as of late. I think they break out the blue and they balance the colors in a way that just a red belt isn't really able to do. The Superman Reborn design was good and probably the best trunksless suit we've had, but it just feels so empty to me still. Like there's just something missing there and he feels naked and not in a fun way. You might say that they look too silly or too campy, but that's honestly what I kind of like about them. Superman's costume is supposed to be kind of campy and a little bit goofy. The design was based off of old school strongmen from the 1920s circus that Schuster and Siegel grew up with. And I like having that bit of visual history. Also, he flies around in a blue onesie with a big red S on it and uses his baby blanket as a cape. I don't think the dude's worried about being silly. Trunks discourse is always so like frustrating because I feel like I explain my reasonings for liking them in like pretty reasonable ways and pretty like understandable ways. And then the response is always like, no, -uh, they're stupid. It's like, okay, I don't know where to go from there. I still like them. What, what do you want me to say? But on top of all that, I think having the trunks would immediately make it clear to even just casual audiences that this is a new Superman, a new universe, and a new direction. Because I honestly think that that's gonna be the biggest challenge is convincing normal audiences about this new era of DC. I have this fear that like the day after this video comes out, he's just gonna drop a suit pic because they're gonna be filming. And it's just like, 
it does, uh. The next thing that this movie has to get right is Lois Lane. I absolutely love the casting of Rachel Brosnahan. She was great on The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, and she honestly seems like the perfect person to carry this mantle because Lois Lane is an incredibly important role. Her perseverance and integrity and attitude, ever since her creation, she's been the pinnacle of a strong female character in comic books and a feminist icon. In all of the best Superman stories, she should be given equal footing to Clark and equal importance. I think Amy Adams, just like with Cavill and a lot of the DCU, for being honest, had a lot of great potential with Lois that unfortunately just didn't go anywhere. Again, it was something that My Adventures with Superman absolutely nailed. Hell, they made a Lois Lane that was so goaded, it sparked a whole bunch of stupid online discourse over her doing something that was 100% the most Lois Lane thing ever. But we've also had Elizabeth Tulloch, Erica Durant, and of course, Margot Kidder, just to name a few, who've all been fantastic and put their stamp on such a landmark character. So I'm really excited to see the things that Rachel's able to bring to the role. And based on how she's talked about her, it really excites me. And on that, I think the Clark and Lois romance is so important to get right. The chemistry between those two is so absurdly important, especially after so many movies just completely let it fall by the wayside. Like, I'm sorry, I genuinely do not believe that these two people have serious feelings for each other. And I think the key to that is making it clear where the relationship comes from. Originally, the dynamic was that Lois was in love with Superman and couldn't care less about the dorky Clark Kent. And back in the golden age, that was played mostly for laughs, with Superman having fun, basically pulling pranks on Lois with it. And we, the audience, were supposed to mock her for not seeing it. But in recent decades, the dynamic has kind of flipped. There's this really great scene in Superman and Lois where Lois tells a co-worker that she's not attracted to Superman because, well, she's already in love with Clark Kent. She loves him for that dorky farm boy from Kansas, and finding out that he's also Superman is just extra. It's more modern change and modern development that I've always really loved, and I want to see them do something similar here. I am interested in how they're going to introduce all these things. James has said this isn't going to be an origin story and that Superman has been active for some time now, so I wonder if that means that Clark and Lois are already going to be working together or if we'll see their first meetings. I'd really love it if they made it like a rom-com and gave the two of them a classic meet cute or something. On that note, the next thing I want to see is for them to actually make the Daily Planet important again. I really miss the days when newspapers were a really big part of superhero media. Obviously, the physical newspaper industry has pretty much died and journalism companies have now moved on to clickbaity titles and AI generated articles, so it's more realistic for the movies to move away from that. Hence why we haven't seen Spider-Man do his most famous job in the movies for something like 10 years, but it allows for such an interesting framing device for stories. Clark is able to get the scoop on disasters and people who need saving without having to go through some kind of third party. It's obviously a necessity for a character like Lois, but I also think that the focus on journalistic integrity is a big part of the fundamentals of Superman's character. You can't have truth, justice, and a better tomorrow without that first bit. I really like how My Adventures with Superman put such a focus on the Daily Planet. Journalism should be something that Clark genuinely cares about, not just an easy way to keep his disguise. I actually really liked how Batman v Superman used Clark in his reporting, with him wanting to tackle bigger and more controversial stories, yet wasn't allowed to. The only issue is that it very much fell by the wayside and was limited to just the three-hour R-rated Ultimate Edition. Now, we recently got news that Wendell Pierce, probably most famous for his role on The Wire, is going to be playing Perry White, which I'm really excited about. I always loved Lawrence Fishburne's take on Perry. He was such a standout casting, and I wish we got more screen time with him, so I'm hoping that this Perry is able to play a more prominent role. And the Daily Planet also allows for so many other recurring supporting characters like Cat Grant or Steve Lombard or, of course, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen. I'm so glad that Jimmy Olsen's finally coming back to the movies after all of that. Jimmy is genuinely one of the most important Superman supporting characters ever. Not only are his comics fantastic, they led to some of the best work by comics legend Jack Kirby, but also for what he represents for Superman. Jimmy is, for all intents and purposes, the only regular person in Clark's life. Sure, there's Lois, but she's a world-renowned Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. She doesn't really fall in the same category. That's like saying Batman is a regular person. This traumatized genius billionaire detective with infinite gadgets, years of martial arts training, plot armor out the wazoo, and a butler. Yeah, that's a realistic normal guy for you right there. But Jimmy, he's just a regular dude with a camera. And we can see through his relationship with Superman the ways that anyone can do good, how everyone can be Superman. Also, the Daily Planet really needs the globe on top of the building. We've had it as a boring skyscraper for way too long. Not only is it such iconic imagery, being this beacon for the metropolis skyline and representing the power of truth and journalism, but it also just looks really fucking cool. Segwaying off of that, the next thing that this movie has to get right is Metropolis. For too long, Metropolis has been portrayed in movies like a regular city, like just a knockoff New York. And I'm getting sick of it. One of the most special things about the DC Comics universe is its willingness to use fictional cities and settings for its heavy hitter characters. Instead of having every superhero all within the same 20 blocks and within the confines of reality, they're spread out across the world and their settings fit their characters perfectly. Metropolis needs to be a character in its own right. In the same way that God 
Gotham City is at its best when it's cranked up to 11, either with Burton's absurd architecture or the red skies of the animated series or Matt Reeves' rainy gothic shithole, and not just a carbon copy of Chicago. The city works so well for a character like Batman because Batman is the only character that works for that city. And Metropolis should be the same. It should be a city that feels like it's made out of gold. I'd love for them to pull from classic art deco architecture for the building. The skyline should be futuristic, but at the same time, reminiscent of a simpler time. Nostalgic for the past while promising a brighter future, with a sense of unwavering optimism that only could be the home to the Man of Steel. And the same goes for the people of Metropolis. I want to see the culture, the history, even the dark side that is inner gang in the seedy underbelly of the city. But most importantly, I want to see the ways that Superman himself is impacting people. I need to see Bibbo, for God's sake, that's gonna make or break this universe, I'm telling you. On a similar note, I want to see the same treatment made for the Fortress of Solitude. I think that the Fortress has the potential to be as cool, if not maybe cooler, than the Batcave. I want to see all the alien technology, the robots, the science experiments, not just a bunch of ice and crystals. I love you, Superman and Lois, but this was just not it. The next thing that they have to get right is Lex Luthor. <laughs> All right, for real though, I'm really excited for Nicholas Holt as Lex. He's one of my favorite actors right now. He was especially great in The Menu. He was just such a little loser asshole in that movie. He's perfect for Lex Luthor, dude, I'm telling you. Lex Luthor is one of the best villains in all of comics. He puts on this facade of smugness, of intellect and strength, but really deep down, he's an insecure loser who's jealous that people love Superman more than him. Especially nowadays with so many annoying billionaires to pull inspiration from, I'm really interested in what they do with him. Jesse Eisenberg, once again, could have been an interesting Lex if he was given the right material. Despite the very obvious typecasting, there is legitimately an interesting commentary on the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world to be made there. But the movies made him so wacky and crazy that he didn't really feel like Lex Luthor. Now, I'm not really sure what role Lex would have in this movie. I kind of don't want him to be a main villain or anything and would rather him be a more subtle antagonist. Honestly, I'm not sure if I even really want a specific main bad guy in a traditional sense. But if we do get one, I'd prefer someone more like Mongol or Parasite or someone we haven't seen before. But what really excites me is that recently, Nicholas Holt just did a podcast with Michael Rosenbaum, aka the Lex Luthor from Smallville, aka the best Lex Luthor of all time. Listen, I know I said I'd make a Smallville video, and I really want to, because there's a lot of crazy shit in that show. But by the time I finished it, I'd forgotten what happened in the early seasons, and so now I have to rewatch the whole thing all over again. Hey, that show's so fucking long, dude. I'd have to pull a Quentin Reviews and split it across three separate nine-hour videos, and I don't know if I have that dog in me. Funnily enough, the Jimmy Olsen that got shot in the face? Yeah. He's from Smallville, but in that interview, Holt name dropped a specific scene from All-Star Superman where Lex is bragging about his muscles, saying that they're real while Supermans are fake. Firstly, I just love it when actors casually mention comics like that, not in like a OMG, we love the comics kind of way where they clearly did not read that shit, but just like dropping it in conversation. I remember Cavill would talk about the Rebirth comics a lot of the time, and Matt Reeves would talk about Batman Ego. Especially lately when so many creative teams are told to specifically not read any source material, it's really refreshing to see some of that love. I feel like James Gunn probably forced everyone on the cast to read All Stars homework, and I think that's really funny. I think it could be interesting if they went the same direction as Smallville and Secret Origins having Clark and Lex know each other when they were younger. I'm 50-50 on that when it comes to the comics, but for adaptations, it's really fun, and I think it could be a really interesting way to set up their relationship and do something a little bit different from the other movies. I think it is so funny that there's an episode of Smallville where Lex goes to meet this fortune teller, and she gets a vision of him being so evil, blood rains down from the sky, and it literally kills her. This show's great, I love it so much. The next thing that I want is for James Gunn to keep it simple. I know we've gotten casting news for characters like Mr. Terrific, Metamorpho, Hawkgirl, and Guy Gardner. And while those characters are great, I love the castings and I'm excited to see what they bring. At the same time, I really don't want this movie to just be DCU setup movie part one, Dawn of Justice League International. It's been over 10 years since we had a solo Superman movie with the last one being controversial to say the least. At this point, all I really wanna see right now is a good Superman movie and that's kind of it. I know that James is great when it comes to ensemble casts, and he's proved that with Guardians and Suicide Squad, and I don't think including other characters makes it not a Superman movie anymore. But I also know that, in a sense, the entire future of DC and Warner Brothers and maybe even the whole superhero genre is resting on this movie's shoulders, which is honestly kind of fitting for the character of Superman, but it's a lot of pressure. And because of that, it might be tempting to try and do too much, to try and set up characters like the Authority or the Lanterns or Batman, but I think that would risk dragging down the rest of the movie with it. 
Honestly, the most setup I'd want to see is a couple of smaller mentions and maybe a credit scene with Millie Alcock's Supergirl in teasing her movie. I'm not saying that I think James will fall into these trappings. I think he's talented enough and knows what he's doing, but I can understand how that could be tempting nonetheless. So many studios and executives tried rushing their cinematic universe. They saw the gold mine that is, or I guess was, the MCU, and they wanted a piece of that pie, so they rushed into it head first. Warner Brothers tried it with the DCEU, Universal tried it with their dark universe of monster movies. I don't even know what the hell's going on over at Sony, but Madam Web was really funny and I wouldn't change a goddamn thing about that movie. Where's my spider? They took my spider. Say it's a genetic neuromuscular disorder. But I don't have a neuromuscular disorder. Life and none of them ever really hit the stride that they were clearly hoping for. I think audiences, frankly, are kind of burnt out on the whole cinematic universe thing and just want a clean, good movie. I mean, even the MCU started out smaller. Iron Man was successful as a universe starter because at its core, it was a good movie. It focused on being the best Iron Man movie it could possibly be before anything else. And I think James should do the same with Superman. And so if this whole DCU thing doesn't work out or David Zaslav cancels everything else for a tax write-off, we can at least have that. A good, clean Superman movie. I do want to see the fucking dog though. Make it happen, James Gunn. One thing that I want to see, or more so one thing I don't want to see, is I don't want this movie to just be another Superman 78. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely love Richard Donner's Superman. It's arguably the most important superhero movie ever made. It set the groundwork for everything we know about the genre, and without it, the landscape would look completely different than it does now. Christopher Reeve was an absolute legend. He was a perfect Superman, the embodiment of everything the character stands for. And the same goes for Margot Kidder as Lois. Even if you hate this movie, you can't deny the sheer level of cultural importance that it has. But as much as I love that movie and Donner's depiction, I kind of think we need to move on a little bit. For almost 50 years, every modern Superman is still being compared to it. I mean, we've had two attempts at a solo Superman movie since then, and one of them was literally a weird half sequel, half reboot of the Donner movies 20 years later, where they gave the main actor blue contacts to look more like Christopher Reeve. If that's not the definition of stuck in the past, I don't know what is. And don't get me started on the gross AI generated zombies that they used for the Flash movie. And now with the casting of Terrence Rosemore as the character of Otis and Sarah Sampaio being listed as Miss Tessbacher, two characters original to the Donner films, I'm a little bit worried that this movie might be doing the same thing. I mean, even the titles are the same now. Although, not to be that guy or anything, but actually, Superman 78 was officially called Superman the Movie. I'm really interested in the direction that they're going to go with the music for this movie, because on one hand, the John Williams theme is so iconic and recognizable, but I really loved what Hans Zimmer did with the Man of Steel soundtrack, taking the same elements and changing the motifs to better fit that version of Superman, using sounds and instruments other than the classic brass and horns, and it always really frustrated me when they used the Williams theme, as great and iconic as it is, for Cavill Superman. And so I kind of would rather they go in that same direction, taking similar elements and light motifs, but rearranging it and building it in a way that creates a unique sound specifically to this version of the character. James Gunn is an insanely talented director. I've seen a lot of people saying that he's not a good fit for Superman, but I've always been on board with him for this project. I made a whole video about it. And I want to see him bring his A game with this movie and not try to replicate anyone else's story or style. I want the same insane insane kinetic camera work from the Suicide Squad. I want to fall in love with the characters like I did with Guardians. I want Suicide Squad's crazy title cards. Nobody talks about those enough. And I want a 30 minute long version of the Adam Warlock flight scene. I don't just want to see more of the same thing. I don't want to be stuck in the past anymore. I want a James Gunn Superman movie. The next thing James Gunn has to get right is Pa Kent. In universe, Jonathan and Martha Kent are single-handedly responsible for the creation of Superman. More than any superpowers or a Kryptonian escape pod or holographic jor projection, it was their parents parenting and their innate kindness that led to Clark Kent becoming the person that he is today. Man of Steel made some interesting decisions when it came to John Kent. I don't hate all of them. I think it's interesting to explore Jonathan that's a little bit more unsure and worried about how the world would react to Clark, but I think they ended up going a little bit too far with certain things, and we never got that same innate goodness from him that I think is necessary for the character, specifically when it comes to his death. Pa Kent's death is a watershed moment for the development of Superman's character. The idea that even Superman, this character who can do everything, isn't able to save his own father from a heart attack, that he can't save everyone, but he still blames himself for not seeing it soon Man of Steel used the tornado, and while it fit those themes about John protecting his family, I think it lost a lot of that nuance and didn't consider the greater ramifications for the Superman mythos moving forward. And more than that, I think that fatherhood as a concept is very important to Superman in general. I've seen a lot of takes lately of people saying that James Gunn movies aren't sincere, that they're just filled with quips and one-liners and the characters never show any real emotion and all the serious moments get undercut with jokes. And the only thing I can say to that is... 
I don't think you've ever seen a James Gunn movie. Guardians, Suicide Squad, even Peacemaker are all incredibly emotional and sincere stories. Yes, there's comedy, but there's also genuine moments of raw emotions. Specifically Guardians 3, Rocket's storyline is one of the most painful things I've ever seen in a movie. And especially for a story like this, after the way that Gunn has talked about this project, how he didn't initially want to make a Superman movie because he didn't have the right angle for it, and it wasn't until the passing of his father that made him realize that and realize the story that he felt he needed to tell, releasing the movie on his dad's birthday. And pulling so much inspiration from All-Star Superman, a comic that Grant Morrison specifically wrote to deal with the grief of losing their own father. It was a story that said, this person in your life who you think is all powerful is still human. He's the strongest person in the universe, but still has the same problems as you or me, and he won't live forever. It was very clearly inspired by the way that Grant viewed their father. And I think a lot of people view their fathers and I, that's why the book is so good. And after all of that, I think it's incredibly disingenuous to try and say that Gunn is just gonna make this movie all jokes. James Gunn is no stranger to making you cry at a movie. And I think if he's pulling from this very real place of pain and grief, this will be no exception. And the last thing I wanna see from James Gunn Superman is for it to earn its title. When it was first announced that the movie was gonna be called Superman Legacy, I wasn't really in love with that title. It was a little bit generic, it felt kind of like a fan film, and I was worried that the subtitle would muddy the water a little bit for general audiences thinking it's part of the old DC. Over time, I grew to actually really like it. I started thinking about what it could mean, about how legacy could be a theme for a Superman story and all the different things that could represent. It could be legacy is in your heritage, or legacy as a father, or the legacy that you leave on the world. All of these ideas started to really interest me and I started to get really, really into it. And then with the suit reveal, we learned that the title changed, which is totally fine. Titles change during production all the time. There's nothing new there, but it was the way that James Gunn talked about it. How after reading the script, he knew that there could only be one title for this movie. Now it could only be called Superman. It's a name that carries a lot of weight to it. In the same way that Matt Reeves called his movie, The Batman, it was kind of a statement. It was him as a director saying, this movie is the definitive Batman movie. And honestly, it kind of lived up to that promise. The Batman to me so perfectly encapsulates everything that I love about the character from the shadows and the vengeance to the gritty detective work, but also the hope and the light that he inevitably brings to the world. The movie was long as hell, don't get me wrong, but Matt Reeves made something that if for whatever reason he never got a sequel, if part two or all these spinoff shows never got greenlit, he could be confident in saying he made the Batman. And so if James Gunn is able to bring even a fraction of that energy, even if he doesn't give us the trunks or the dog or the spinning globe or anything else I talked about in this video, if he's so confident in his script and his cast and his team that the only thing he could call this movie was Superman, then I think we're in for something really special with this one. And I, for one, can't wait for Superman Legacy. Ah, fuck, I did it again. But what do you want to see from James Gunn Superman? A lot of people have asked me if I'm going to be doing a an in-depth like fanboy pre-write for this movie. And believe me, I really want to, but I got this idea in my head for how I want to do it. But that idea has just like ballooned and grown like a little bit out of control for right now. And so for now, I just wanted to use this video to still talk about the movie and things I want to see. And I just want to say really quick, thank you all so much for helping this channel get to 100,000 subscribers. Seriously, it's all like completely unreal. I, I like this job is my dream. And I'm so grateful every day that I can just talk about the things that I like and tell stories. And I'm really grateful for everybody who's helped make that possible. Also, that was way more than 10 things, but whatever. If you liked this video, be sure to let the YouTube algorithm know and hit the like button and subscribe. Special thanks to Alta the Sting, Anz, Cabbage Boy, Cassidy, Caroline Brenneman, Chicken McDoofus, Cook C, Cosmic Tragedy, Danny Boy, Dreamer Who, Eden Kenna, Egan McFarlane, Hannah C, Howard Bell, Iron Ninja, Jake Selig, Corey's Not Fresh, Glass Bear Production, Murren09, Pencil Fan, Popcorn Eater 123, Spectacular Clyde, Tim Newfeld, Trans Huntress, Tyler Goodrich, and Yush Kapoor for being spectacular fanboys on my Patreon. This has been Troy Boy 17 coming at you live. Be responsible and I'll see you around.